Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anargia. I'm an investor at a venture capital firm called Mavron. We invest in direct-to-consumer businesses. And one category we invest in early stage up to Series A is AR, VR, uh, the next kind of frontier of technologies that consumers will adopt. Super excited to be here today with several friends and fellow folks working in AR, VR, and everything in between. Excited to talk to you all about storytelling in this space. Um, I'll have everybody go through and quickly give an introduction as to what they do and where they do what they do. I'll go. Yeah, please. This is on, right? Yeah, Karen. Uh, my name is Karen Dufalo. I'm executive producer at Google Spotlight Stories, just around the corner here. And we're interested in telling stories in immersive environments. Uh, Ryan Horrigan, chief content officer of Felix and Paul Studios. Uh, we're an immersive entertainment company focused on cinematic VR, uh, now game engine VR, and AR and mixed reality. Hi, uh, I'm Yelena Rachitsky. I'm an executive producer of experiences over at Oculus. I help oversee our slate of uh, storytelling content that we fund and, and produce. Hi, everyone. I'm Tony Parisi, head of VR and AR brand solutions at Unity, uh, the technology that powers a lot of the XR. And uh, we work with all the people up on the stage uh, doing various kinds of enabling on the content side. I'm these days focused on uh, brand advertising, experiential marketing, and how that connects to creative media and entertainment. Great, thank you all. So to start off, um, to give the audience and all of us a sense of what you mean by storytelling in XR, what does the storytelling look like? What could it be? Anyone want to jump in and tell us a little bit about what that storytelling is? Do you want to start us off? Oh, well, I, it, we don't make the content at Unity, we power it, but I can talk about experiences that I love. Uh, some of them are made by Felix and Paul, but I'll leave that for Ryan. Um, I came out of Sundance and Tribeca Film Festivals this year, more jazz than ever about what's going on in VR. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are concerned about it being stalled in the marketplace and all these sort of negatives, but the fact of the matter is the content creation is absolutely incredible. Uh, no one's stopping on making amazing stuff, and I'll just cite, like, the example that blew my mind at Sundance of many, many, many things I saw uh, was a piece called Spheres. Uh, I hope you get a chance to see it at some point. It is a uh, science and education piece that explores the wonders of the universe. It's in the Oculus Rift. It's created by this wonderful filmmaker named Eliza McNitt, um, narrated by Jessica Chastain. And we were talking about super professionally produced content now. It was picked up for distribution at Sundance. It was the most exciting thing that I was a part of. I, I was at the birth of the universe, floating and watching black holes collide. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah, well, thank you for that advertisement for Spheres. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, Elaine actually the, produced it. The second episode premiered at, premiered at Tribeca. Um, alongside that, we also had Space Explorers, which Felix and Paul Studios created, which is uh, equally incredible, but also in, in live action. So what's interesting is, um, so I, I've been in this kind of storytelling, innovative storytelling space for maybe like six or seven years now. And watching the progression has been fascinating, but also the redefinition of what people will consider story. And and when I say I work in the storytelling space, I always hesitate a little bit because everyone has an association of what storytelling means to them. I love that, for me, the definition is constantly shifting and changing. So, you know, when VR first started coming out storytelling, a lot of people connected it to traditional filmmakers, you know, making 360 video, uh, all these rules came out about what you can and can't do. Like, you can't move the camera, you, um, you know, you ha can't have an edit, you can't have this. And what is incredibly exciting right now is that everyone's thrown out a lot of those previous rules, and a lot of creators have finally found their voice in, um, in the creations. So the technology starts disappearing a little bit, and uh, I'm also starting to focus a lot more on interactive storytelling. So that starts blurring the line between gaming and more linear storytelling, where with interactive stuff, you get into the space where it becomes more experiential. So the storytelling and the story is the experience that you had afterwards, like the story that you realize that you had that you took yourself through. In that like blurry line is that, that place that I'm living in right now and really understanding. And that's very akin to just how we live our everyday lives. Like the story we're creating, the things that feel most natural, the natural gestures, the natural movements, natural conversations we're having with people. Um, and that's also happening across different platforms. When it comes to XR, I think VR is one of the more evolved in this very <laughs> short time span, one of the more evolved 
storytelling platforms beyond the traditional and you know regular digital means. Um, so you're able to do more, but it's going to be interesting to see how that transfers over into AR and. And, so and before we jump to Ryan, can I ask you, you talked about rules and there being a notion of rules in prior mediums of storytelling. Are there any early rules right now that you're seeing in XR storytelling or specifically maybe VR since you said it's a little bit more evolved? Uh, I mean, it depends what technology you're using. So if you're using live action, it's different from game engine. Um, in the game engine world, there's... Uh, <laughs> it's hard to separate the getting the technology right with the creative, mm -hmm. because you can tell an incredible story, but if you don't hit frame rate and it has horrible latency, then people are taken out of the experience somehow. Um, I can't say there's necessarily uh, creative rules, because I've seen so many different creators take a different approach. Like the thing that was really interesting with the, we had five projects at Sundance this year, um, and each of the projects had a, the, the audience had a different point of view. One, it was first person. The other one, it was an observer. Another one, you were like in the form of a star. Uh, another one, you're in the form of an imaginary friend. So the role of the audience was completely different in every single one of those pieces, but they all worked in their own way. So I like the keeping it open. Yeah, it just has to have the right intention. Yeah, I don't think there's any rules, and if there were rules, they were short-lived, and, and that's good. But uh, what's great about the space is there's really a wide spectrum of what a story can be, and unlike, say, cinema or theater or television, there's not a really tight formula of, okay, it has to be an edit produced with a camera, with photography, it has to be this long, this is the tempo, this is how you shoot it, this is how the production team will work, and we're just going to do that for the next 100 years. I mean, that's more or less what cinema has been. Um, and of course, there's been a creative evolution, but the way in which we make film, of course, amplified by new technology to create films in more interesting or easier ways, has been relatively the same. Um, but in VR, like Yelena was saying, it could be a live action project, it could be a game engine project, it could be volumetric capture. We were going to talk on this panel, it could be, you could be now using voice and AI, you could be um, looking at other technologies for distribution, blockchain, there's different business models, there's sort of this like, beautiful soup of things, and uh, that's great. There's no right or wrong answer, and I think, you know, for me personally, when someone says, oh, this thing, this way, is gonna be the winner, I, that nothing makes me more upset than that. I don't, I don't think there's like a, there's not a right answer here of what kind of content we need to be making. And talk a little bit more about the additional technologies you see plugging into VR storytelling, why they work. Yeah, well, I think, you know, as the headsets um, continue to evolve with the glasses, if we're talking about AR, and we're starting to track your retina, we're starting to track um, sort of your body language, what does your posture mean, the poses you make. Um, there's been some companies looking at just looking at your hand gestures and what does that say about you and your, your, your mood or your personality. Obviously, AI characters is really interesting. AI characters understanding you and your human input, voice, being able to talk to characters, gesture, um, just from a technological standpoint. Um, everything being done in the cloud with 5G and mobile edge computing and blockchain for distribution, um, brain computer interface, we could go on and on. Yeah. All these things people are starting to experiment with. Um, you know, in AR and VR, and they're all exciting, and no one really knows yet um, fully what is possible with them. Cool, thank you. So. Karen, what's, what's your perspective on what are the, what are the stories being told? What, what do you spend most of your time on in the AR, XR storytelling sphere? Well, I think for us it's about um, the teams, you know, and who's telling the story. Sort of just to go back to what we was being mentioned here, rules, no rules. Um, I think, if anything, when you're telling a story, what you're looking for is a presentation of some kind of structure. And you're looking for that to be authored, right? So you might be part of that story. You might be interacting with a character. Um, you might be interacting with, uh, so, such that you're affecting that story. But I think that if you, as an audience person, I still like to think of it that way, um, with what we do anyway, um, I think you still want something. I, 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 I think you still. I, I know I want something that's still structured and presented to me in a certain in a certain way. And that structure, you know, goes back to you know how how best to tell a story. And once you know structure, then you can kind of mess with it. Just like once you know how to draw something, you know, uh, you know, from uh, 
you know, a, a natural way of drawing something, then you can experiment and get stylized. So I think that that's sort of where where we sit with it. And do you mean that structure as the end consumer of the VR or as the creator of the experience? I guess I mean as the creator of the experience. I think if you're if you you put a story out there and it's in VR. Uh, uh, as a person who's watching it, you're like, you don't go, oh, look, that was a really well-structured story. It's like, oh, that's cool. They knew what they were doing. I felt something, and it had sort of like some sort of emotional journey to it. So that, that's what's important to us. And so related, so I was thinking on the consumer side, what are the challenges of being able to or being not able to guide someone in a VR experience. You may go into VR and maybe people who've never done mm -hmm. it before will stra stare straight ahead, but people who've done VR may look all around. That is a great question. Sorry, are you finished yeah, yeah, asking no, it? No, so go for think it. about that a lot and sweat that a lot because you know, there's such a, we're trying to make something for everybody as much as possible. And spe specifically thinking about VR, is it someone who's used to it and been at it for quite a while and they have it at home and they're all plugged in, they're ready to go, or is it, you know, your aunt who's up for dinner, right? So you're trying to make, and no matter what, you're trying to make the experience begin even before they're putting on the headset and turning, you know, turning something on, really thinking about that. It's a design thing. Aesthetically, that's a design thing from am I sitting, am I standing, really thinking through all of those things. And, um, and that's hard. It's hard to think through all of that before you even, you know, frame one so to speak. So yeah, we think about that a lot. I know that you guys, well, all of us must think about that quite a bit. Can I, can I tie a yeah, couple please. of these threads together? Because it got me thinking when Yelena said earlier about the technology fading into the background. I think that's largely true except for input. Um, I'm finding still that a lot of the cinematic pieces, at least, um, are struggling with what you do with the controllers. You know, maybe we've got some more stories about that from some of the folks creating the content, mm -hmm. but I found in even the most transcendent things I've been doing at these film festivals and the, the leading edge stuff, absolutely agreed on uh, it's faded into the background in terms of I'm not thinking about the headset anymore. Mm -hmm. My body's fully in it, but I still don't know what to do with my freaking hands most of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you guys could, you know, elaborate on that and some yeah. of the I'm kind of curious, like, is have. that important to people? Like, it, oh, it doesn't have controls, so I'm not going to watch it. Or, oh, it does. Like, right, because, I mean, for some things, maybe you don't even need the controls, that way? Yeah, right, as I'm, long as you're immersed yeah, I, and I having know. a great yeah. time. I think uh, this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot recently, is just this concept of embodiment and what does that mean in, mm -hmm. in VR. And it, I feel like what's challenging is that, you know, when we think of VR in this big way, we think of everyone as the audience, but everyone has such a different um, association with VR. So specifically, you have gamers. So gamers are used to controllers, they're used to buttons, they know how to navigate, navigate it, it's easy for them to use. And it's easy for a lot of technology companies to um, think that everyone will have an easier time with the controllers and make them slight more intuitive. You show an average person, uh, you give them something with buttons, it's overwhelming, like mm -hmm. don't know which buttons to go, which don't know which buttons to use. Um, but it's the best we have right now. Um, there's a lot of work being done at all the companies that's trying to figure out how to make your hands work in a much more intuitive way of being able to see them. There's leap motion, obviously, but there's you know s some challenges where there's a narrow field of view, your hands get lost a little bit, how, how exact can it be? So it's all, it's all gonna continue getting better, but the thing I really, really want people to think more about is just understanding what it means to have a body in space like understand that human condition in a, in a, in a deeper way. Like, cause a lot of times people think too intellectually about creating content. It's about the, what happens. It's about the, what you're hearing. It's about the, what you should do next, but it's not about the like body and space. And what does it mean when my hand has to reach out? Or what does it mean when my body has to crouch down? And why does that feel good to someone? Why does that feel natural to someone? Um, and I want to, I want to see more content with, thinking with that in mind of, of pushing towards the most like natural feeling experience possible and then it'll feel good. It'll be more accessible to the people outside of the gaming world. I um, think that when body connects though to sort of a narrative idea, like I'll reference Super Hot, which is probably a game mm -hmm. people have played, yeah. when you can take physicality and then actually tie that to an organizing principle within a narrative structure, whether that's a game or a story, then I think you hit like a real crescendo or a sweet mm -hmm. spot where you're like, okay, my body is part of the story, mm -hmm. right? My body is driving the timeline. Right? I think that's great, you know, that's, that's really, and that's hard to do. That's, there's only a few of those 
projects out there right now. Yeah, and, and we've been working a lot with immersive theater companies and thinking and trying to understand that because that that's something they've been doing in real life is guiding a, a physical body in space, understanding where attention goes, why someone's guided, uh, you know, what feels good. But when you're standing there and your body is just like limp and you're watching something incredible, your limp body sends signals to your brain about something being boring. Mm -hmm. So how do you associate with what you want someone to do in connection with a thing that they're supposed to feel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, talking about feeling maybe completely immersed or even disembodied in the experience, how do you all think as both creators and enablers of creators about is there some responsibility or way to say, hey, you are in VR um, or you are fully immersed in this non-real experience? And how do, you, how do you think through that or how do you advise the developers on your platforms to think through that? Who wants to take that? Go ahead. Go, go. Uh, that's a great question. I'm not, I'm not sure if we specifically adv advise creators on that, and our work is going to be quite different than, than some of the others here, yeah. um, because it really does sort of lean more into a traditional storytelling as you know it. Um, but I think you, I love that, uh, that sentiment of guiding bodies and, and giving you a reason why. You can't dismiss it. You can't, that's one thing we do advise creators. That's an important thing and you need to answer that. So what is the reason that you've put someone into this story? Who are they in the story and how are they affecting the story? And have you executed well on that? It's important to know from day one. Yeah. Were you also talking maybe about the responsibility of the creators to sort of, um, well, like for example, if you saw someone uh, murdered in VR, right. like you do in, in a movie, that's, that's a lot different, right? Like totally. it's more visceral. There's a responsibility maybe as a creator that you have to uh, the types of content that you're actually creating and what impact that might have on people if they're feeling embodied. They're yeah, don't do present. that. No, don't do that. <laughs> But exactly. That's my advice. Or maybe there's a rating system <laughs> similar to movie rating. Well, system. certainly, yeah. No, are, you, are you guys? You guys are rating stuff, right? right. Yeah, there's there's yeah. there's some yeah. levels that the store goes through to look at the different pieces of content. But the hard part is that because VR is such a sub subjective thing, everyone is triggered by something completely different yeah. based on the experiences that they've had in life. So you can't, um, you know, not you, you you know you can't account for understanding how everything is going to uh, affect everyone, but you can know the basics of yeah. like extreme violence or, um, you know, extreme nudity or, you know, something like that. So there's, there's a base level that I think that I think is definitely covered, but it is, you know, it's a definitely tricky about what, where, when people are affected and when people are not affected. And I think everyone's continuing to learn that. Um, but as the, in the question of getting people like, prepared for VR. Um, I've also just been thinking a lot about like that space in between uh, being in the real world and getting into VR and there's not enough thought of like how do you Mm -hmm. ramp someone up so mm -hmm. what is that onboarding mm -hmm. like how do you gently bring someone into an onboarding I find it to be kind of jarring to be like in a big convention lots of talking and then you put on the headset and you're stuck in that you're in that world what's that kind of in between space where you where you prepare and then you can fully be um, you can fully the be white room the, okay, matrix, so the white room from the matrix or, or I, yeah or an architecture like <laughs> the hallway that you go in, in yeah, between to deprive your sentence the lobby well the lobby. I, mm. I, I promise Yelena didn't put me up to this, any of what I'm about to say, <laughs> as well as the other thing, but um, the Oculus Go is a great step forward, and I think I'm getting my uh, Mirage Solo coming soon, too. Um, just having something that is, the, the, the setup and the BS is going away, yeah. I mean, that is a, just a massive step forward. And you pop a thing like that on the Mirage Solo, it's like, hey, let's go, where do you want to go? And it's immediately, you're using it, there's none of that, so you, you haven't gone through what's anywhere from five to 50 minutes of horrifying setup and angst just to get to the you know, 10 minutes of great. So I think that's gonna radically change that. I mean, it's still on us, I think, as designers to have the white room and the other things that make that easy. Well, you don't need to buy something else. You don't need to buy a phone. You don't, you don't need, need to buy, buy a, a phone. It's all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's gonna be a great helper for that, bringing people into the, the virtual world, absolutely. Let me throw something out there. What do you think of the phone and potential AR as like, you're doing this, you're doing this, 
we're, we have headphones in, we're used to these digital layers. Can that be a transitory way to full immersion? Is it a completely yeah. separate thing? Are there better ways to make it more of the, the lobby to VR? How do you think about that? Well, yeah, when, when it's glasses and you can sort of oscillate between a mixed reality or AR and VR, you know, as a spectrum. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like you can start in your world and then a character is on your table and he, and he or she is telling you, hey, come to the, my magical kingdom. And then things start to grow around you and then you're in this immersive world, right? Like we can really onboard you to, to the point Yelena was making in a, in a more uh, comfortable way from your living room or wherever you are. AR kit and AR core are the best thing that has happened for VR. This is the way that's going to introduce immersive content to way more people, mm -hmm. way faster. Mm -hmm. And these lines are gonna converge over the next few years so that we're gonna have just, you know, uh, VR natives who are just ready to pop into those experiences. Yeah, I, I definitely hope so. I, I, I feel like, um, <laughs> was it maybe like eight, nine years ago, everyone used the word transmedia and then the word transmedia died. Yeah. And now we're bringing transmedia back but calling it multi-platform or, or XR. Um, but I love the idea of content being told amongst all these different platforms. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it done well yet though. Um, it's hard enough telling like one good story. Yes, it's because it's hard. It's hard. And it takes it's, a lot of money. It's, and it's time. hard. It's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to even have a good experience on like a traditional film or like a great movie. There, there's a lot of really bad movies, and that mm -hmm. you, why should there be bad movies? People have been learning about it for so long. Mm -hmm. There's still bad movies. VR, we've just you know in this last wave, it's only been around for like four or five years, um, and people are starting to do something good, uh, and all these different platforms like you know even at, at, so I work at, at Facebook, Oculus. Uh, as many of you know, is owned by Facebook. And you know, we think about how do we use all of those platforms like effectively um, for the story. So can you take something from VR, take a 3D object, put it into newsfeed with like 3D in the feed, which just came out recently with going to AR, with going to Messenger. Um, all of that sounds really incredible, but it's hard enough to t do one good experience on one of the platforms. How do you do something that fluidly ties together and makes you want to transfer from one to the other? Um, and I'm super excited to discover it. So if anyone has good examples, <laughs> please tell me. I think it's how do you do it and what is it, right? Because it's not like, yeah. it, oh, anything will do. Not right? any, right. Not and is it the idea. same story or is it the same world? Or is it the same character? Yeah. And who's, how, do you, how are you writing for that? How are you creating for that? Where's the spark of the idea? Yeah. You know, so I, I, it is, it is, it is a very tricky they, thing. And do they elevate each other, right. or do they all live in their separate universes? And do you need all of them to then have sort of this unity right. of a whole thing, or does is one okay? Is one yeah. Good well, and, and, and if you don't, then what's the point? Is one the main content, and the others are really just content as marketing, and really they, they feel like content, but they're really just marketing to right. keep you in these. And so loops. don't. And so pass. Yeah. <laughs> no thanks. But that's happening. People are going to be doing that. But it, but if it's if it's if it smells gimmicky, then yeah. I think that that just diminishes. Mm -hmm. Has to, it either has to be original, I think, or it has to have a reason for existing yeah. beyond promoting something else. Maybe yeah. even as a proof of concept or proof of tech or something that's interesting. But I think for it to like have legs get up and walk, it's going to need yeah. to have some. It's going to need to be good. And yeah. do you think this this first one comes from um, indie developer groups? Does Disney make something? Does Google, Facebook, like where where do you think this will come from? The kids. <laughs> well, I, I think, the I think what would probably happen I is hope independent, so. in, independent developer is going to create the idea behind it and a franchise is going to see it and apply it to one of their IPs and once they do, then the mainstream public is going to recognize it because then they have an, a, an emotional association with that character. Um, one of the d companies I'm working with, Fable, um, they, you know, we, we funded Wolves in the Walls, uh, and um, their, you know, their approach right now is being very character based. So they're trying to focus on, like, you know, Wolves in the Walls as a character, Lucy. Can Lucy live once people have a connection with this specific character? Can she live in other worlds? And people get excited about being with that character in different spaces. So I like how they're thinking about it, like a character a focused thing yeah. versus mm -hmm. just one specific narrative. So then you're attached to something. But imagine something that a lot of people are already attached and connected to, like. Um, what do people love? Like SpongeBob. SpongeBob lives in a, in a bunch of different places, or uh, your favorite Disney character lives in a bunch of different places. I don't. I, don't, I really don't know what like young what people hot are Disney right now. characters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I can cite a specific example. I, I cited in my talk yesterday. So uh, 
Unity's, Unity's rolling out to say our ads platform, and we've done this uh, wonderful first creative with Disney. And what you do is you walk into Scrooge McDuck's vault from DuckTales using AR on your phone. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those transmedia examples where you take an IP and you've brought it, you know, so that's sort of content marketing, agreed, right? Yeah. But you can imagine those kind of techniques where you create original story around AR, and you do the AR version like, like what Edward and team are experimenting with, like you're talking about, where that, you know, that character transcends the different media format, yeah. right? Or a piece of the property does, right? But not you're not trying to recate the story and in if the character can wrong format. If the character can seamlessly flow between those and you can follow it, that's great. Like we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. Right. Yeah. That's um, something so she can just do. A quick timeout for the audience. We'll jump into questions in like in two or three minutes. To, so please submit them um, on the question platform. Um, a couple other questions for the for the panel. What are the challenges of storytelling in AR? If we think that that's going to maybe take off sooner, you then run into the issue of the world. Right. How do you navigate that? What are the distractions? Well, it's it's not exactly the opposite of VR, but you know we, th we think about VR as we're we're bringing you to other worlds, and we can create any world. Great. Okay. Well, in AR, we're bringing other characters or worlds into your space, and then you're defined by the limitations of your space. Right. So. Like one of the first things we thought when we saw, um, uh, you know, a mixed reality demo, for example, was there was a character floating above a table, and we sort of said to ourselves, "Why is this in mixed reality? Why? Why? Why do we need this in our living room?" But when that character is not a fish but a frog, and he's got a cane, and he's tapping his cane on the table, and then there's a hole in the table, and something falls mm -hmm. through, it's actually using my space. So I feel like. If it can actually work within your space and, and sort of link up with the physicality of your world, then, then that becomes magical and then that sort of has a reason to be, for me at least, in mixed reality. Maybe AR being more simplistic by definition doesn't do that or can do that. But for me, it's like we need to be able to bring these characters and stories into your world, but then also make them seamlessly integrated with your world. Yeah, One the of challenge the, of, oh, the, ahead, of, your, of your question, yeah. what's, what's the challenge? Of the, the challenge is the world. The world, yeah. 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 The yeah. challenge is the world. The challenge is the world. Yeah. The one effective use I've seen of this thus far where it was storytelling and AR also repurposed some, some IP. Um, it's this uh, beloved storybook uh, called The Gruffalo. It's a, it's a British yeah. uh, sort of story. I didn't know about it before. It was built in Unity and done in AR. And, and, and uh, Nexus Studios from LA created this thing that, that lived in a forest in England. And they used the forest as the canvas to tell this story and turned it into an adventure using those characters. That's fabulous and that's a really great way to use it. The challenge is how do you take that and then bring it into a living room or the tabletop like you're saying because right. environments can be so disparate. Mm -hmm. And you don't want, I mean it's great that they brought people out into the nature and they were able to do that story there as an adventure. But if you want these things to scale and reach more people, you can't rely on that pure location based venue well, either, and there's like right? So how do you actually make experiences like that that can run kind of anywhere? Mm -hmm. And there's two big like tropes or cliches I think in AR is the, the tabletop dollhouse maquette story and then the, the, the cracks in your walls thing comes through, through the walls into your living room. You know, we've seen that, you've probably seen that dozens and hundreds of times. Like we have to figure out what else we can do beyond yeah. those two things, right? right? And, and yeah. piggybacking off of that, are most of the AR VR stories going to be solo or is there multiplayer or multi-person experiences? Definitely multiplayer. I mean, definitely in VR. That's what, yes, that's what like Oculus and Google and everyone's working on. But I think in AR too, if you're looking at like a lot of this conference is about the AR cloud and there's all these AR cloud startups. It's about multiplayers and persistence and being able to uh, do things together and collaborate, being able to return to things that you did earlier and have other people see them and they're locked to a physical location and, and Huge, that's huge. Yeah, and that gets back to your immersive theater thing, Elena. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. also the, um, it, so we've been thinking a lot about social and social code presence. There's, you know, there's an inherent challenge right now with social code presence. It's your friends being in VR at the same time as you. So right, right now it's, you know, not as easy. So what are other ways you can think of social in a way that feels meaningful? Like Ryan mentioned, you, they can contribute to your experience. So you can connect VR with AR. So imagine someone's in a VR headset and you're doing an experience and then you, you know, your, your friends are over and they put up their tablets and they can see what's in your world with their tablets or their phones. Mm -hmm. And maybe they can add stuff to your world or maybe they can connect with stuff in your world. So you're finding this way of people connecting with each other in something that feels meaningful and they feel like uh, they're making a contribution, but not everyone has to have a headset at that time. At the same time, like where thoughts go, right? Like recording messages that then can be yeah. experienced later, yeah. right? So there's, yeah, I guess the, the words that we're using is like, 
asynchronous, uh, right. which would be people record messages and then, or you take up the headset and someone else continues the experience, or asymmetrical, where people have a headset and then uh, someone else doesn't have a headset. Or there is this game called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, where yeah. someone's in a headset and someone, someone else has like a paper and they have to lead them in the way of um, how, where they should go, and it's exciting. And, and so I'm thinking a lot about educational experiences right now too, um, and working on a couple thoughts, and you know, thinking about the classroom setting, like that kind of thing could be easier. It's less friction for the teacher, more fun for the students. Like, how do you make everyone feel engaged without the necessity of uh, co-presence within a virtual space together? Also, live streaming, I think, which I believe. Oh, yeah, we just launched um, Oculus Venues uh, a couple days ago, actually. But also streaming to phones, like so, like I'm in VR, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, or even in AR, right? And I can stream something to social media that other people can watch live, like Twitch style. Totally. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's a big thing I think that needs to happen or is happening, right now. Um, last question for the panel before we jump into questions from the audience: Why does this matter to you? What do you care about within XR storytelling? Why is it important to you, or not just to you, but, but culturally and, and to a larger audience and, and world? Well, I just, I, that's a great question. Um, for me personally, I just, I, I, I love working with artists and creators and makers, and so it's just a really fun way to live your life, right? And I think maybe that also then goes into like why we should care at all, because I think that there's, there's something there in all of that, you know, that m maybe, you know, um, has some impact on us. It's like a nice, a nicer way to spend your day. I hope it can all be used for good, right? Some of the stuff is a little frightening for me, uh, a little horrifying. Um, I have kids, and sometimes I'm like, oh, what are they going to be picking up? Um, and then I go, oh, that's okay. They'll be fine. They'll be fine if we're uh, if we're all, you know, sort of encouraged and inspired by 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 art. Yeah. I think for me, it's just. Uh I want to be part of stories. I don't want to just watch stories. I want to be in stories, and I want to participate in stories. And I would imagine people have wanted to do that for a long time, but now it's possible. So yeah. for me, that's the singular reason. Cool. Yeah. Elena? Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I love immersive technology f for the potential of being transport transformational and, and meaningful. And I keep on wanting to push it in that direction versus feeling like, like a toy. Because I think you can create some really powerful experiences that feel like memories, that write in your life, that make you understand things more deeply, that connect with people in a different way. Um, so all of that, to me, is kind of where my passion lies. Tony? I mean, I'll echo just what came down the line and just yeah. say that um, we've been telling stories as long as we've been people, right? I mean, we've been painting on caves and telling stories around the campfire, and all of these media just elevate in terms of their capabilities and production values. And when we can be in those stories, like Ryan said, instead of just uh, spectating, that's, it's, our lives are going to be very different. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, we'll jump into some questions from the audience. So the first question is about uh, building. So when it comes to building teams to craft XR experiences, what skills or background are you all looking for? in that storyteller role. Anyone want to jump in? I think Elaine in? is the answer, the person to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think you know, there's, there's a few things. I, part of it is creative, part of it is technical. So um, if we're building something in Game Engine, like have they built something in Game Engine before and do they know what they're doing? <laughs> uh, and then for the creative, like what is the intention? Like what is the intention? What is the feeling you want someone to create? Like what is the goal? Uh, and you just, you creating something you know you like you know when you meet someone like and they have an idea in mind that is um, like you know comes from like a place of authenticity and you know is a specific vision and you know they want to achieve something then like you trust that so it has to be the combination of that creative intent along with the, the technical expertise Anything else to add, or we can jump to the next Just question? Just part yeah. of that question about this to fill the storyteller role. Yeah. You know, know what you want to, what do you want to, what story are you telling? Is it more the, the traditional way of telling stories mm -hmm. that we know this, this happens, then what, what's next, what's next? Or is it experimental, but you know, know your craft? Great. Um, next question is about rating system um, for the unique aspects of immersive media. And we talked a little bit about this, but anyone else want to add to that about the personal space, the different things, and how they could affect people of different backgrounds? I, th I think a lot of this is asking about like social co-present experiences of creating a safety system. I think it's less about a rating and more about the experience itself having abuse prevention that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's actually working. Um, I know the stuff that we're creating that's social, that's a huge 
you know, work like, you know, venues was uh, launched a couple of days ago and there's a way if, if someone feels uncomfortable, they can block that person, they can report that person, there's active bodyguards. Um, so there's just a lot of work being done to make yourself feel comfortable and, and, and feel safe. So there's a lot of experiences you can go into that if you're a female, like you really want to get out of there as quickly as possible. Um, so it's really up to the developer and the creator to create a strong abuse prevention system that makes everyone feel comfortable in the space. Great. Um, I love the, love the question about how can young creators wake older storytellers. <laughs> and I think this touches on so much of the creative storytelling UGC is coming from, from teens and tweens. How, how yeah. can they participate and, and how can they shift the story around linear versus nonlinear? Mm -hmm. So the question was how do we get older people to <laughs> be woke to this? wake older to, to nonlinear, <laughs> yeah, story to find think an older person. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but older storytellers. I think we I mean, all count as old. Yeah. I think well, you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. I think I set myself it, up for that. Maybe like older filmmaker, yeah, like yeah. older creators I, who are used to a traditional way. I don't know if it's an older ageist. Audiences. I don't think it's an ageist thing. Like, you know, we've, we've talked to <laughs> creators yeah. who are really open-minded when it comes to interactive storytelling. Um, traditional filmmakers, for example, we've had some really interesting conversations with Terrence Malick, um, who makes really experiential films. If you're making big summer tentpole movies, maybe you're not necessarily in the right state of mind to mm -hmm. just dive right in. And the same is true for other disciplines and other f art forms, right? So I don't think it's an ageist thing, but I would say that um, certainly the younger folks who are learning Unity, and I think Unity mm -hmm. and, and Unreal in film schools are, are already huge and they're gonna get bigger and bigger. And really it's about learning how to create with those tools. Yeah. And that's the new news. It's no longer like, hey, can I just get a camera? It's like, can I learn how to create these worlds in, inside of engines? Mm -hmm. I, I, I would just add, I, I think there, I think they're already sort of woke to this. I mean, I was shocked with the, the, at the speed with which Hollywood really picked up on VR, mm -hmm. like so fast, and there was so much movement. Uh, maybe it's you know, a lot of economic factors and other things, but it, it just seemed like there was so much enthusiasm for the potential as a new storytelling medi medium, and it didn't matter if you, you know, if you were Spielberg or a new up-and-comer, everyone was sort of getting it, right? Now, p people are gonna get it and execute on it, well in different degrees, but I think Hollywood's rather woke in the, in the storytelling community. I don't know what you guys think about that, yeah. but. Yeah, um, I, I work with a lot of pretty well-known directors who are um, working on a lot of the, our, our VR experiences. And um, I think there's, a, there's, there's openness for some. I don't think all traditional filmmakers need to be VR or AR creators. That's no. not what their talent it is. It's not what their interest is isn't. It's really for people that are curious and think in an expansive way. I think it's a mistake to go after someone because they're a big name yeah. and then try to tell them they should do something or give them a bunch of money because if their curiosity isn't there, it's going to end up being a stale experience. So I don't think you necessarily need to do that. But as far as convincing people, I'm a really big fan of like the curated playlist of creating like, I love taking especially people who haven't done VR before, like through this journey, um, you know, starting off with like one experience and maybe giving them about four total, but each one of them showing them a different way to think mm -hmm. about VR. And then their wheels start spinning a little bit, then their eyes open because they see, they connect how they think about story, how they connect uh, their creativity with the possibilities of the new technology. And that's always the, the best starting place. The, the, I think the, the challenge oftentimes is when people's first experiences are just kind of not great and the, the thing they saw is not great and they've already made up their mind about what it is and they're like, it's not, it's not for me. And I would just add if that question was actually like a gatekeeper question. Okay. Um, I don't know that there are, you know, the gatekeepers of, that there was perhaps in like the movie business way. I think there aren't. There, there, right. there, there are none. There aren't. Yeah. You go, make something distributed. It's all there for you. Make it good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you all so much. Thank you for all the panelists for yeah. joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And um, I think there were a couple other questions, so hopefully you can catch the panelists out and about in the, in the fair to talk to them. Thanks for coming. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you.